We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yeo Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Sangal. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's going. Yeah. Okay. So, it is a new month, which means it is time to shout out our amazing patrons. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Shinifer and Tom. For continuing to support our show, mm-hmm. the goats are amazing, and the goats. Absolutely. Thank you both. Yay. And if you don't know what goat means, it's the greatest of all time. Mm-hmm. It started as a sports reference. <laughs> <laughs> Go sports. And then pop culture was like, we like that. It's ours now. They're like, that's hilarious. I'm going to take this. Yep. I also want to give a special shout out to Juno Jewel over on Instagram for their amazing drawing of the three lion cubs in a trench coat. Essentially, it's our first ever fan art, and we couldn't have been more thrilled with the first one that we ever received. And I will share it on social media in case you did not see it as part of our Instagram and Facebook stories. It's pretty amazing. And I love it. So thank you. You know, no, it's incredible. I was so excited because I had that, I had it in my head, and I couldn't figure out how to make it come to life. And you did, and that was awesome. So, thank you so Mm -hmm. much. It was really well done. On that note, (laughs) are you excited for this week's topic, which you know nothing about? Maybe depends on the topic. I'm cautiously optimistic. (laughs) (laughs) I picked something that you have said in the past that you enjoy. So this week, we are going to be discussing Confidence Woman Mary Carlton, a.k.a. the Grey Widow. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Confidence Woman. All right. So like like a con artist. Yeah. Let's do it. Ooh. If she was a a con artist that's routinely a widow, she murdered a ton of people, huh? But it's a Grey Widow. That's that's the thing. So we'll get into it. (laughs) I don't know. I will explain. <laughs> Gray means she got them killed. No. <laughs> <laughs> Gray means weird area. Yep. All right. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2018 Ranker article by Genevieve Carlton, who we have done lots of work with in the past. She's so lovely. much work. Yeah. Way to go, Genevieve. You are probably one of our top contributors on this podcast, <laughs> whether you know it or not. You're like a third (laughs) co-host. Pretty much at this point. A 2015 article by Janice Lydell. 2010 History in Women article. 1993 Tulsa Studies in Women's Literature article by Mihoko Suzuki. Dictionary of National Biography, 1885 to 1900. The X Classics website. Find a Grave. Library of Congress. The National Portrait Gallery. Oh, I suppose I should add this one. And Wikipedia. (laughs) <laughs> Although I didn't really use it, but I should still, you know, note it because I did mm-hmm. look at it for source material. So gonna That's add that now while I'm thinking of it because I will forget and then it won't be in the notes. This is the song that I sing when I'm doing that. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. <laughs> nice. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes, or over on our link tree to get started today. Mary Motors was born on January 22nd, 1642 in Canterbury, England. 
the daughter of a chorister slash fiddler of the Canterbury Ooh. Cathedral in Kent. Nice. So kind of a fun, a fun kind of creative family. Sounds like yeah. musical family. Musical. Many sources say she was actually born on January 11th, while others say it was as late as August 11th. And even in a book written about her, it says she was born as early as 1634 or 1635. Ah, the tale is old as time. How old is this woman? I don't know, because we didn't care enough about her to officially record her birth. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to go based on her word, although, as you'll soon come to learn, it isn't worth much. Yeah. Given her father's occupation, it's hard to know what sort of education Mary had growing up, but it's fair to assume that given the fact she was born a girl, it wasn't great. Yeah. Probably a lot of street smarts versus street smarts. smarts. (laughs) Regardless, she was an avid reader and enjoyed reading books about romance, particularly including knights. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, because this is kind of... This is after the Middle Ages. Yeah, so th- this would be still like kind of fantasy level. Yes. Mm-hmm. She was all about that historical fantasy romance. We don't know anything about that. No. In 2023. 20, no. Nope. Can't relate. No. Mm-mm. Even though Mary likened herself to a princess, or at least wished to be one, don't we all? Mm. Yeah. Instead of marrying a fanciful knight, she married a journeyman shoemaker named Thomas Stedman. I mean, close enough. He could make her some glass slippers, I'm sure. I'm sure. I don't think they'd be very comfortable, but... Probably not, but... He he had the skills. Or at least tailor her a pair of fanciful shoes. Mm -hmm. The pair had two children together, both of which died in infancy. Mm. And... That was the extent of what I was able to find on that. Mm. That's too bad. Not long after this, she ran away from her husband, who wasn't wealthy enough to, quote, support her in the splendor she always aimed at, end quote. (sighs) So she took up with a wealthy surgeon named Thomas Day in Dover, who, not knowing she was still married, tied the knot with her in 1658, which landed Mary in Mm. jail for bigamy, following her arrest and trial in Maidstone. Oof. If we believe her date of birth, this would have made Mary 16 at the time of her second marriage. I really hate that. Mm -hmm. But that's also very much of could be a real thing. Yep. And that would also make it more logical, too, that she was that reckless and wanting to get married again. And her, like weird justification of like oh well you can't afford me so i'm just gonna run away and find somebody that can bye just not thinking of any consequences yep mary was able to get an acquittal when the court was unable to prove she was a bigamist her first husband thomas never appeared in court to back up the charges nice he's probably like i really don't want to associate myself with her anyway so yeah like or he was just like, I just don't care. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Whatever. Wasn't super into marrying her anyway. He's like, she hated my shoes. Get yeah. her out of here. I don't care. She was a weird half size. I don't want to deal with this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she had different sized feet. <laughs> it was awkward making shoes for her. Yeah. And she decided to leave both her husbands and England to travel to Cologne, Germany. Okay. Better castles? Mountains, more more fantastical landscape, maybe? Maybe. It was here that Mary reinvented herself after having Mm -hmm. a brief and steamy love affair with a local nobleman. At 17. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great. He lavished her with gifts, which was said to include, quote, several fine and valuable jewels, a gold chain, and large sums of money, end quote, and even asked for her hand in marriage. She was a sugar baby. (laughs) Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. He was so besotted with her that he even began planning their nuptials. Hmm. Fearing a repeat of what happened in England, 
Mary snuck out of Germany with the many gifts that her lover had given her, Mm -hmm. as well as most of her landlady's money, before traveling back to England via the Netherlands in 1661. Damn. She really doesn't care about anybody. (laughs) No. Got it. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. She took a very circuitous route. Very circular route. She went all over the place. Okay. To avoid detection by her erstwhile lover and the landlady she'd stolen from, traveling to Utrecht, then Amsterdam, where she sold much of the treasures that her lover had gifted her, before moving on to Rotterdam, and then Brill, from which she left to travel back to England, where she arrived at Billingsgate. Hmm. Yeah, that is quite quite the trek. But I bet mm-hmm. I bet she had a great time. It reminded me of that, like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Like she's right. just kinda like traveling all over the place. Mm-hmm. I wonder how like dangerous it was though. Since she was still yeah. kind of a young woman with a bunch of money on her own. Yeah. I wonder how she did that. Mm-hmm. Safely. Yeah. Maybe she didn't do it safely, you know? Maybe she, like, hid in carriages and stuff. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mary arrived in London on March 31st, 1663, under the moniker of the German princess, Princess Maria van Walway from Cologne. An orphan, following the death of her father, an earl named Lord Henry van Walway of Holmstein, she had fled to London to escape a considerably older, 80 mm. years old, mm. love possessive lover. Well, that's quite the story she's woven. Mm-hmm. She had a lot of time to make it. Mm-hmm. She stated that at this time, she was 19. She's not. I'll tell you the real age later. <laughs> the only known physical description we have of her stated that, quote, she has high breasts, a very graceful appearance, and speaks several languages fluently. End quote. Mm. Are you sure it wasn't gibberish for some of the languages? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, wow, wah, it's wah. so beautiful. What's that? Uh, Southern French. <laughs> you know, I speak dog of wisdom. Wah, wah. <laughs> ah, wah, wah. Mary used this story to win the confidences of a a vintner and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. King, who owned the Exchange Tavern at which she was lodging, where she stated that she made 80,000 pounds a year, or 13.5 million pounds today. Holy smokes. You know, casual. Casual. (laughs) After only two weeks of knowing one another, on Easter Sunday, April 19th, 1663, Mary married 18-year-old John Carlton, who was the brother of Mrs. King and a law student at St. Bartholomew's Church. The pair married, quote-unquote, legally in the same church on April 21st after getting a marriage license. Mm. I was just going to say, like, you can get married on Easter Sunday <laughs> back then. Apparently it was just, like, a ritualistic thing, and okay. then they officially did it, like, three days later. It's like, aren't you supposed to, like, make that day about the guy that rose from the dead? <laughs> Apparently not. Call me crazy. Apparently like, No, not. it needs to be about me. <laughs> you don't understand. That guy was just three lion cubs in a trench coat. <laughs> three lion cubs in a trench coat, trying to get into a movie. Yeah, you guys don't even know. Unlike how she portrayed herself, Mary was actually 21 at this time, not Ooh. 19. Cougar. Cougar vibes. Meow. <laughs> it wasn't long after the pair had married, yep, marriage number three, Mm -hmm. that John received an anonymous letter exposing Mary for the bigamist liar that she truly was. Ooh, I wonder who was following her around. Right? Just some, like, really crazed person that's like, she's lying. She's lying. I'm going to tell you. (laughs) I'm going to learn how to write. I'm going to learn how to write (laughs) and read. I'm going to tell you all about her. (laughs) I pictured that gif of that, like, creepy balding guy who's, like, coming out from behind, like, a plant. You know what I'm talking about? Picture that guy. 
Anyway, the letter read as follows. Quote, Sir, I am an entire stranger to your person, yet common justice and humanity oblige me to give you notice that the pretended princess, who has passed herself upon your brother, Mr. John Carlton, is a cheat and an impostor. If I tell you, sir, that she has already married several men in our county of Kent, and afterwards made off with all the money she could get into her hands, I say no more than could be proved were she brought in the face of justice." that you may be certain I am not mistaken in the woman, please to observe that she has high breasts, a very graceful appearance, and speaks several languages fluently. Yours unknown, T.B. Okay, like, were her breasts, like, abnormally high? Like, I don't understand. I don't know. Why were they, like... Up where they're, like, wow. Her breasts are, like, she has, she's got, like, no decolletage. <laughs> she is all breasts. I was just, like, is she... Are her breasts like the testicles of her neck? Like, are they just yeah, like I just that? They just attach to her collarbone. They're just like yeah. right there. I, oh, how? Why? Like, why was that an uncommon enough characteristic that they keep? Like, I don't know. Listen, you'll know exactly who she is because she she will have the highest breasts in all the women. <laughs> I don't understand. She is the Cinderella of high breasts. Yep, highbrow, high breasts. That old chestnut. That old chestnut. So I misspoke. This letter was sent to Mr. King, so John's mm. brother-in-law. Yeah. Not John. Either way, understandably, John was pissed. And yeah. thus, Mary found herself arrested once more on May 6th on the charge of bigamy and was brought to Newgate. Mm. It was here that she made the acquaintance of Samuel Pepys, a famous diarist. I feel like we've mentioned him in the past in an yeah. episode. I can't remember yeah, which one, but he has been in an episode familiar. before. Mm -hmm. Who took an interest in her tale and would become a recurring figure in her life. Mm. The retelling of the events differ a little according to the Mary Carlton narratives from 1663 to 1673, a missing chapter in the history of the English novel by Ernest Birnbaum, Ph.D., which was published in 1914 by Harvard University Press. In it, Ernest states that a friend of Mr. and Mrs. King was suspicious of Mary, and he wrote a letter to his acquaintance in Dover, where she married the surgeon, mm -hmm. to inquire about her. It was at this point that he received the following letter. Quote, Dover, May the 4th, 1663. <laughs> May the 4th be with you. <laughs> Sir, this morning I received your letter, dated May the 2nd, instant, and accordingly have made inquiry. By what I can discover, it is a gentlewoman that is the greatest cheat in the world. She hath now two husbands living in this town, the one a shoemaker named Thomas Stedman, the other, it says Chergian, but I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be surgeon, named Thomas Day. She mm. was born in Canterbury. Her maiden name is Mary Motters or motors. Her father was a musician belonging to Christ Church, Canterbury. She was lately in Dover Castle, a prisoner, taken out of a ship bound for the Barbados, where she cheated the master of fifty pounds. If it be she, I am sorry for your friend's misfortune. If I shall refer you to Mr. John Williams, his wife, who liveth near St. Saviour's Dock, New Stairs, near Red Riff, she is the master's wife of the Barbados ship. And if you can prevail with her to go to see her, she will give you full satisfaction, whether it be she or no. Mm. I pray you send me a line of appearance of the business and the man's name that is married to her and his calling, for it is reported a minister took her up at Gravesend. My respects to yourself and father. I remain your loving friend, unknown. End quote. Mm. So, I mean, got the two mm. names right. Yeah. I'm just really curious, like, who these people are. Right. Like, who is this friend? Are they just, like, following her around like a little creep? Does she know him? What's going on? Like, does she have, like, somebody who's just, like, behind Stalking a building her. everywhere she goes? Maybe. The Sam Pepys, he had a diary about the Great Plague of London. And, okay. And the Great Fire of London. And I think okay. we both of those. Yes. Yeah. That would explain. So I was like, yeah. his name, 
is familiar. And I want to know why. And then it said Great Plague and Great Fire. And I was like, yeah, we covered both. We like fires and we like plagues. I don't think we've done the plague, but we for sure have done the Great Fire. So that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, Because I was like, I know we have talked about him before. and I think we touched on the Great Plague when we did that episode during the pandemic about pandemics. Yes, but we haven't fully gone into it yet. Yeah. It's on my list. It'd be a month of episodes at that point. Yeah. Mary's June 4th, 1663 trial at the Old Bailey was her first recorded appearance before the public. Mm. She was charged for assuming the identity of a German princess and marrying John Carlton under that alias. Mm. Mary claimed that John had misrepresented himself as well, stating that he was a lord who was now looking for a divorce once he realized she didn't have any money. Hmm. So she was like, you're lying too, bitch. Mm -hmm. Pot kettle. (laughs) Bear in mind that divorce was relatively unheard of at this time in history and considered scandalous in the extreme. Yeah. Like all of this is top Mm -hmm. tier. Like this is, this is if Bravo TV (laughs) had just a blanket reality show. She'd be a housewife for sure. It's already been a hundred years since King Henry the Eighth, like allowed divorce, but mm. even still, like, but yeah, he he created the divorce for him. Yeah, like, not I for the really, people. I really doubt anyone of like normal blood, moral fiber. <laughs> yeah, like I don't think anybody else did it because it still was super taboo. Till death do you part, and you died from anything. <laughs> yep, it won't be long. Mm-hmm. In fact, legislation had been changed in 1604, quote, an act to restrain all persons from marrying until their former wives and former husbands be dead, end quote, which changed the offense of bigamy from one of penance and forgiveness into a felony. By all accounts, Mary could hang for this. I mean, if you piss the right person off, Mm -hmm. that's what they want. Both of them published pamphlets proclaiming their innocence, but at the end of the day, the court ruled in Mary's favor, and she was once more acquitted when the Carltons were unable to clearly document Mary's bigamous past. Dang. She was even recorded as saying to John, quote, You cheated me, and I you. You told me you were a lord, and I told you I was a princess, and I think I fitted you. End quote. Damn. This is ye old bravo. This is like those pamphlets are tweets. <laughs> yeah. And I wow. This is like ye yeah. old reality TV. Everybody I would watch this. I would read this. Mm-hmm. I would learn to read so I could figure out what's going on. <laughs> the illustrations weren't great. Right. <laughs> the animals depicting this scandal weren't weren't as good. Weren't good. They used an elephant that had no, no trunk. knees. <laughs> no trunk or knees. <laughs> <laughs> How do I even know it was an elephant? I don't know. I don't know. Firmly of the mind that no press is bad press, Mary capitalized on her newfound notoriety by writing and publishing her own book entitled The Case of Madame Mary Carlton. It is believed she used a ghostwriter and didn't actually write any of the book herself, which is fair. Yeah, I mean, who's, who's to say that she could write? You know, at this point, we still don't know what her education was. And if she was trying to be somebody that she's not. We don't know. And we don't know how well read (laughs) or spoken she is. Yep. Not only that, but Mary played herself in a production that was written about her titled The German Princess, Mm. resulting in her being showered with gifts and jewels by her avid admirers two of which she fleeced out of 300 pounds each or 51,000 pounds today. So that's $102,000. She's, she's a yield. Thousand pounds. Yeah. She's an Instagram girl. She was the original Instagram girl. The play was performed at the Duke's house in Dorset Gardens. Pepys saw one of her performances on April 15th, 1664, and stated of it, quote, never was anything so well done in earnest, worse performed in jest, end quote. Awesome. 
Mary's final dialogue of the play at each performance was the following. Quote, I've passed one trial, but it is my fear. I shall receive a rigid sentence here. You think me a bold cheat. Put case, twere so. Which of you are not? Now you'd swear I know. But do not, lest that you deserve to be. Censored worse than you can censor me. The world's a cheat, and we that move in it. In our degrees do exercise our wit. And better tis to get a glorious name however got, then live by common fame, end quote. Period. Mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. She was, she was reality TV. Yep. Personified in the 1600s. <laughs> yep. Fun fact, Mary even went so far as to marry one of her many gentleman suitors, mm. a 50-year-old man named Mr. Chamberlain, who showered her in, quote, several valuable presents of rings, jewels, etc., end quote, who also received a salary of about 400 pounds a year, or about 68,000 pounds today, before she absconded with, quote, 20 pieces of old gold, a gold watch, a gold seal, an old silver watch, and several pieces of plate with other valuable movables to the value in all of 150 pounds, or twenty-five thousand pounds today, his pocketbook with a bill for one hundred pounds upon a goldsmith in the city, or around seventeen thousand pounds today, and the keys of his trunks and escritoires, which is a small writing desk with drawers and compartments. Oh, funny! End quote. While he was drunk, that's a that's a lot of work. So she 21%. took all those things. Yeah, she was like, "Listen, this isn't my first rodeo." Yeah, I'm gonna take your things. You take a nap. Love you. Bye. <laughs> I rub some rum on your gums. It's fine. Yep. yep. Put some absinthe on your lips. It's all good. Just, just ride, ride the wave. Yeah. Just sleep. On the lamb once again, Mary assumed another alias. This time as that of a rich virgin heiress oh, God. who was fleeing an undesirable suitor that her father had betrothed her to. Hmm. I wonder if she used liquid gold to keep her breasts high so she could remain young. In an effort to make this story more convincing, she arranged for one of her acquaintances to send her letters containing fake news about her family. Having fled with 1,000 pounds, or around 169,000 pounds today, that had been given to her by her uncle. Hmm. Well... The ruse worked a little too well, uh -oh. as Mary's landlady found and read the letters one day, going so far as to arrange a match between Mary and her nephew. Great. Capitalizing on this good fortune, mm -hmm. Mary arranged for another letter to arrive post-haste, mm. <laughs> yeah. which read as follows. And this is a little long. Quote, Dear Madam, I have several times taken my pen in hand on purpose to write to you, and as often laid it aside again, for fear of giving you more trouble than you already labor under. Oh, no. However, as the affair so immediately concerns you, I cannot in justice hide what I tremble to disclose, but must in duty tell you the worst of news, whatever may be the consequence of my so doing. Oh, no. Know then that your affectionate and tender brother is dead. I am sensible how dear he was to you and you to him. Yet let me entreat you for your own sake to acquiesce in the will of providence as much as possible, since mm. our lives are all at his disposal, who gave us being. Mm. I could use another argument to comfort you that with a sister less loving than you would be of more weight than that I have urged. But I know your soul is above all mercenary views. Mm. I cannot, however, forbear just to inform you that he has left you all he had, and you know further that your father's estate of 200 pounds per annum can now devolve upon nobody after his decease but yourself, who are now his only child. Mm. This is quite frivolous. <laughs> yes. What I am next to acquaint you with may perhaps be almost as bad as the former particular. Oh, no. Your hated lover has been so importunate with your father, especially since your brother's decease, 
that the old gentleman resolves, if ever he should hear of you any more, to marry you to him, and he makes this the condition of your being received again into his favor, and having mm. your former disobedience, as he calls it, forgiven. While mm. your brother lived, he was every day endeavoring to soften the heart of your father, and we were but last week in hopes he would have consented to let you follow your inclinations, mm -hmm. if you would come home to him again. But now there is never an advocate in your cause who can work upon the old man's peevish temper, for he says, as you are now his sole heir, he ought to be more resolute in the disposal of you in marriage. Mm. Wow. Daddy issues abound. While I am writing, I am surprised with an account that your father and lover are both preparing to come to London, where they say they can find you out. Whether or no this be only a device, I cannot tell, nor can I imagine where they could receive their information if it be true. However, to prevent the worst, consider whether or no you can cast off your old aversion and submit to your father's commands. For if you cannot, it will be most advisable, in my opinion, to change your habitation. I have no more to say in the affair, being unwilling to direct you in such a very nice circumstance. Mm. The temper of your own mind will be the best instructor you can apply to, for your future happiness or misery during life depends on your choice. God grant that everything may turn for the better. From your friend, S.E. All right. You should know that that's not real just because she said, oh, a young woman has a choice. Please. Hashtag truth. Please. You ain't got a choice. <laughs> the letter prompted the landlady's nephew, Mary's new lover, to invite her to live with him after he instantly proposed. Mm. I wonder why. Crazy. The poor man ended up flat broke and heartbroken when Mary and her accomplice, who pretended to be her maid, robbed him of, quote, a bag with 100 pounds, or 17,000 pounds today, in it, mm -hmm. and several suits of apparel, end quote. Sounds about right. Mary continued this bait-and-switch tactic of being a rich virgin heiress for the next decade. How? I don't know. Jeez. Frauding several men and landlords out of their fortunes with the aid of her quote-unquote maid, earning herself the moniker of the Grey Widow, as she didn't wait for her husbands to die before choosing to remarry. Hmm. Got it. That's where that comes from. Gray, not black, because they were still mm -hmm. alive. They're still kicking. Mm. The main reason she got away with it for so long is because many of the men she tricked were far too embarrassed to admit that they'd been duped and robbed. Yep. Yeah, I bet. Like older men, proud men. Mm-hmm. And although she was accused several times for her crimes... She was always only jailed for a short time before being released to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. The first offense that actually stuck was when she decided it was a smart idea for her to steal a silver tankard. Think of like a beer stein. Okay. For this crime, she was given the death penalty, but the sentence was commuted to deportation and imprisonment at a penal colony. Damn. You take a beer stein? She, she like, tried to pseudo-marry a million people, and they're like, no, just don't, okay? Slap on the wrist. She steals a beer stein, and they're like, death. Because it was pure it's silver. Instant that's death. More important, that's more important than men's Mary. fragile egos. Mm -hmm. Mary was sent via boat to Port Royal, Jamaica, in February of 1671. While there, it is said in a couple sources that she was employed as a sex worker, but I doubt that's the case. I think that was just kind of... If anything, she could do yield only fans where her high breasts get painted for money. Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. Right? She'd be like, listen, my breasts are super high. Paint me like one of your French girls. <laughs> <laughs> I am in a French colony. <laughs> let's, just, let's just do this thing. Mm -hmm. I have a ship to catch. Yeah, well, all those settlers in France would, or in Louisiana would have loved to have her high breast photo. Oh my God. On their so much. In their, just pasted in their mud huts. <laughs> the ye old man caves. With, with their <laughs> Who's that high breast <laughs> hussy? <laughs> who, who has breasts like that? That's so gross. 
They're so high. <laughs> I was told this was a civilized country. <laughs> she was somehow able to return to London two years later after either sneaking or conning her way onto a ship, once again portraying herself as a rich heiress. It was probably conning, because I feel like if she snuck on the ship, it would have been worse. Like, she probably would have died. Mm-hmm. Her latest ruse ended with her marrying a wealthy apothecary at Westminster Abbey. Like all the others, she robbed him blind of 300 pounds, or around 54 and a half thousand pounds today, and then she left him. Mary's life of crime finally caught up to her in December of 1672, when she was caught by a man named Mr. Lowman, a turnkey, or a prison guard, at Newgate, on behalf of another man named Mr. Freeman, whom she had jilted in the past, and who had hunted her down in order to retrieve his stolen property. Yeah, there are some men who don't forget. <laughs> nope. Because they probably weren't as well off as the others. And mm -hmm. really needed that money. Mr. Loman tracked her down to a home in New Spring Gardens, followed her into her room, where he found letters regarding her exploits, recognized her, and took the letters and her to the Old Bailey. Right now. Mary was brought to trial on January 16th, 1673, at the Old Bailey, where it came to light that she had returned to England from the penal colony in Jamaica without permission after confirming that she was, in fact, Mary Carlton. Uh-oh. She tried to stay her execution numerous times, even pleading the belly, or that she was with child, God. which a jury of matrons confirmed was a lie. Mm. That would have been really invasive and horrible. Yeah, but that wasn't uncommon. They did that yeah. a lot. I know. I just shudder to think of what I they know. did to prove that. They didn't have yield first response. <laughs> no. <laughs> clear, clear blue. No. Mm. Pee on this stick. Mm. This information, paired with her numerous crimes, resulted in her getting the death penalty. Yeah. On January 22nd, 1673, Mary was taken via cart from the Old Bailey to Tyburn, where she told the crowd that, quote, she had been a very vain woman, yet she hoped that God would forgive her as she forgave her enemies, end quote, mm. before she was executed via hanging. Yeah. She is buried at St. Martin in the Fields Churchyard in Westminster, London. She was 31 at the time of her execution. Man. She had a really crazy 16 years. No shit. And she got away with it. She got away with a lot. 16 years. Yeah. Yeah, she's quite the, probably one of the, most ridiculous adventurers we've heard of to date. Mm -hmm. At her burial, a couplet was sung about her and later written on her grave that reads as follows, quote, The German princess here, against her will, lies underneath, and yet, oh strange, lies still. End quote. <laughs> later that same year, Francis Kirkman wrote a fictional autobiography about Mary's life entitled The Counterfeit Lady Unveiled. Mm -hmm. And that is the story of Mary Carlton. Nice. I thought you'd like that one. Yeah, that's crazy. She That's kind of the first iteration I've heard of of a commoner becoming kind of a sensation of that caliber, you know? Mm -hmm. like, Y'all, this is why we like reality TV. Because, <laughs> I mean, we had Princess Caribou like way, way back when. Yeah. And I'm sure there were other contemporaries of the time, mm -hmm. but if you think about it, you know, they were obsessed with the royals because the royals were always crazy and outlandish mm -hmm. and could get away with stuff. But it was even more so when somebody who was just a common person getting mm -hmm. away with it because she didn't come from money ever. Mm -mm. So I can see why she would be kind of like a folk hero for a lot of people. Mm hmm a lot of women, young women, yep. wanting to get out of their situations. And just like hearing how scandalous some of the things were yeah. that she got away with. Like mm -hmm. just how much money and like yeah. valuable how, possessions. How do, steal, how do you steal a desk while somebody's drunk? She had the key. So she like went through it and took all his valuable things out yeah. of it. It's crazy. But even still, yeah. Like was he just like passed out on the couch? 
in the next room? I don't room? know. Like, I don't know. It's crazy. But he was like, pass out drunk enough that he didn't hear her rifling through all of his things and running yeah, off like with various trunks and everything. Like that's and like several watches and things like that. Like really expensive things as well as lots of actual dollar dollar bills, y'all. Mm -hmm. Crazy. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me A Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad-free content, not to mention some bonus material, become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. there i'm regina king the evil queen and i'm lynn Roskamp, the docent of darkness and we're the hosts of disturbing interests do you get excited about mummies decorating skulls obsess over the loss of the library of alexandria even though it was lost in a different age do you kill the conversation with your in-depth serial killer knowledge facts about items made out of human skin or have a strange longing to know the softer side of mothman have you spent an objectively disproportionate amount of time studying the life of H.H. H. Holmes? Oh, I, I wouldn't know anybody like that. No, certainly not. Well, I mean, we did call our podcast Disturbing Interest for a reason. That's right. We've got them. And we are doing you the favor of keeping the questions like, at what temperature does it take to destroy a cadaver out of your browsing history? Well, we hope. Because with us, you might be disturbed but you're not alone. You can find us on any podcasting platform under Disturbing Interest or check us out online at disturbinginterest.com. This week's podcast plug is Disturbing Interest podcast from the Darkcast Network. Ooh. Hosts Regina and Lynn delve into the dark things that we find fascinating and then joke around about it. Of course. Why? Because you have limited choices in this world and they choose to laugh about spooky shit. Mm-hmm. If you want to know more about cannibals, killers, ghosts, shrunken heads, shanghaiing, or a plethora of other interesting and disturbing things, then buckle your seatbelt and enjoy the ride. Yeah. Sounds like a similar thing to ours. So if you like us, go, go check them out. Mm -hmm. And we will have a link to their show in the show notes. And this week's listener question comes from our friends over at the Yield Crime Out of Context <laughs> Twitter account. They want to know... What's your favorite embarrassing story to share at parties slash dinners? Oh, uh, when we tried to walk on water. <laughs> that was like, you had that right there. Yeah, it's my favorite by far. I can I can try to say it concisely. Lindsay and I, uh, she's six years older than me. Mm -hmm. And we lived in a very tiny, tiny town of like less than 100 people, I think. Or like maybe. It was, like, it was like 200 people. Yeah. At most. And... I had learned about how Jesus walked on water during Sunday school, and I wanted to do that. And my sister and I, being on summer break, were bored because <laughs> there weren't a lot of kids in our town. It was usually a lot of like retired people, a lot of older people, a lot of older people that whose like grandkids might visit every now and then, but there were mm -hmm. really weren't a lot of kids. And there was a creek. <laughs> That wasn't really a creek anymore. We called it a crick because mm -hmm. it was mostly muck. It had like a film of algae and mud and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. And so Lindsay, <laughs> being the ever innovative older sister, figured out a way for me to walk on water. So we got a bike, a jump rope, a couple of flat logs, mm -hmm. and our dad's favorite boots. <laughs> That was the worst part. So we mm -hmm. go to the creek on the edge of town, and Lindsay ties one end of the jump rope to the bike and the other end around my waist. We put my dad's boots on my feet, and she threw the logs in the creek that, so I could step on them, and instantly they started just being sucked in to mm -hmm. the creek, and we were like, let's just do it anyway. So she's <laughs> it's fine. And I take one step into this creek 
and it's like quicksand. I'm just Mm -hmm. instantly going down and I start screaming. Lindsay starts to pedal. The jump rope breaks, (laughs) (laughs) unravels. And so I'm just sinking even further in this creek. So she has to run up and like pull me out. And my dad's boots are just caked in this like algae and gunk. And I'm scared. I'm crying. And she's like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Let's just go home. And so we go home and she like rinses the boots off. She rinses my pants off and stuff. And we just pretended like it never happened. And our parents didn't find out until we regaled them of the story when I was in my 20s. So it was uh, pretty crazy. And it's one, by far one of my favorite stories. The, the only sad part is those boots that he loved. They stopped producing them that year. And he has not been able to find them ever since. So it's kind of always been my life goal to get him those boots one last time if I can find them. That's my favorite story. Hmm. It's just kids being dumb. Yeah. What about you? I don't know. I don't tell a lot of... I don't think I tell a lot of dumb stories. I'm trying to think of any that I've said in recent memory. Do you have any like stories about your kids that you like to tell? Mm. The only thing that's coming to mind, and this is about you, oh, is no. when we were kids, it was winter... And again, we were living in the smaller town, and we had recently gotten a puppy oh, named yep. Molly. I know the story. Yep. And she was a black lab basset hound mix. Yes, very. She was. She looked fine as a puppy, and then as she got older, picture uh, an all black basset hound with a lab head and tail. Yeah, to me, she, she looked like looked a like. black lab cut off at the knees. Yeah. So like a medieval elephant, she had no knees. She mm-hmm. just was, just chopped them off. Yeah. Anyway, she was still a puppy. I was taking Teddy, our quiche hound Springer Spaniel mix dog, for a walk. And Molly was outside on the lead or whatever. Yep. And Maddie went to go take her to meet me so that we could walk the dogs together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you the next thing I know Molly is like running full tilt at me mm-hmm. and you are holding on to the chain as she is dragging you on your stomach down the icy street and I have no idea how it happened but <laughs> just seeing you being pulled behind this little dog I know. As you're like shrieking, it was so <laughs> funny. Yeah, it scared me because she was, she was so wound up wanting to go where Teddy's going mm-hmm. that it was like sheer force of will to. She was like, "Go, go, go!" And I wasn't ready, and I slipped. I slipped on my stomach, and she just dragged me down with her. <laughs> she just kept going. And thank God I was wearing a snowsuit. <sighs> it hurt Man. too. It knocked the wind out of me when when I hit the ground. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, because it was like winter, like Mm -hmm. the ground was frozen. Yeah, it was icy. (sighs) Yeah, that was the first thing that came to mind. Nice. Was that. And uh, Molly, too, that was when she discovered she liked being a dolphin in the banks. Yeah. In the snow banks. She would dig her head in and then she'd leap out and then she'd dive back in the snow. Yeah, she was really. And then, like, meanwhile, Teddy's walking in the, the plowed street. Next so to annoyed. her. So annoyed. She's like, Jesus, I hate this dog. <laughs> she really This did. dog is so freaking annoying. She hated she, Molly. <laughs> she, she was so mad at her. I She's know. like, I hate you so much. She's like, I have a good thing You're going. so annoying. You Why are along. you here? Mm-hmm. All right. We are running low on listener questions. So if you would like to send us some, I did create a Google form. Just go to bit.ly slash capital A and ask, and then Y-O-C all in caps. We will have a link in show notes. Also on social media, you would like to submit your own questions. Nice. And then on that note, what's something good you'd like to share? I was able to visit our parents this weekend on the long weekend, and it was really nice. It's stupid hot here. Uh, It usually always is on Labor Day weekend in Minnesota. It's kind of like the last push of heat before it really starts to cool down. 
and they had the dog pool out, a little baby pool that they fill with water. And Willie has been having some really bad allergy issues. He's got a pretty bad hot spot that we're trying to fix. And the look of pure joy on his face when he saw the pool and he was able to lay in the pool all by himself. The other dogs let him, left him alone and he got to play ball outside and be in the baby pool, which was his like ritual when he was a puppy and we first, well, puppy, he was two when I got him, but that was like his favorite thing to do for years and years and years and years was to go to my parents play ball in their fenced in backyard and lay in the pool. So he got to do that. And he had that like Ooh. adorable little smile and he was very nice. It's nice to see my grumpy old man still be a puppy every now and then. Mm-hmm. What about you? I'm trying to think. The girls go back to school this week. Nice. Which is good. The house will be quiet during the day when I'm working. Mm-hmm. Did you get all your back to school stuff? Brand new clothes yep. and everything? Yep. We are good. Nice. One thing is over the holiday weekend, we went to my favorite place, Ikea, (laughs) to to pick out an organizer thing for my youngest room. She recently cleaned it and she needed some ways to like organize some of her things. And she was very excited to get an organizer for her room. Nice. And I felt super cool because I got that thing put together like in no time. I was just like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Here is an Ikea organizer. I'm a so, master with the Allen wrench. Same. Mm-hmm. We bought a second one to put in the front closet so we can finally organize the front closet. Nice. And I'm going to be so freaking pumped when that thing stops being a hot mess of just Yeah. It'll be good until the winter, there. and then you'll have to redo it again, I'm sure. The winter coats are so hard. I have a, I have a plan. So okay. if it works out how I want it to going to be pretty sweet. Nice. So we'll see. Anyway, shall we? We shall. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. On TikTok? Of course you are. Follow us at yieldcrimepodcast. A great way to support the show, if you can't do so financially but would still like to help us out, is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, and Audible, and or Audible. And if you do submit a review, please send it our way and we will give you a shout out on the show because we love you and Mm -hmm. we like to do that. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, Click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.